Some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. Well, that was a little blast from the past now, wasn't it? That you weren't expecting that. Just playing with a, with a little, uh, little different sound there in the opener from the Friday forecast. For those of you who've been listening for a while, uh, you'll recognize that sample, the vocal sample from Philip K. Dick in his 1977 press conference at a science fiction literature festival in Metz, France. And I used to um, have a track that I created that uh, used that uh, sample, and I became kind of associated with it, and I'm, I brought it back. And I'm going to refine that a little bit and just kind of tighten it up. I'm learning, I'm still like learning the ins and outs of my new software in terms of uh, sculpting sound. So it's a, it's a start, let's put it that way. But it's good to play with Mercury Retrograde. What do you have in your repertoire? in your treasure chest that's lying around in the past that you can bring back into the future and resurrect, give new life a new form to, because we're dealing with Mercury retrograde in Aries, and Aries is life, Aries is form, it is the spring of life, it is the application of will, and it does represent humanity, right? It's like the thrust, the spirit, the divine breath that connects each and every one of us. Horus is the form. Aries is the spark of life. The first house is the spark of life that we enter into through the ascendant when we incarnate and the journey around the chart begins. And a uh, little Mercury retrograde exercise for me to you. How was everybody today? Got a lot of good feedback on yesterday's show about the Keith Rainier and Nexium. Uh, apparently, and I wasn't aware of this, but apparently Nexium became kind of a, a, a talking point in QAnon. And that there may be some connections between Nexium and, and Hillary Clinton. I haven't made, I have not made the connection. I have not made the Nexium connection. That, is not, that has not been made yet. At least for me, maybe somebody else has. But uh, it was a good show. I enjoyed doing it. It was a lot of fun and gave you some insight into what is going on in the world and how, in some ways, there's really kind of a strange double standard that takes place. And I'm not here defending Keith Rainier. Like, Keith Rainier has, like, think about what his reality is now. He went from basically telling people how incredibly smart he was and sort of regurgitating that to them and them falling all over, all, they were falling all over Keith Rainier and him failing consistently to capitalize on his intellect. And what I mean by that is he was taking money 
from uh, Sarah Bronfman and then invested it into the futures market. And he kept losing. Like Keith Rainier had a gambling addiction. So, so in actuality, he, I mean, he was, I mean, he's a smart guy. He's like, uh, you know, this his list of achievements has uh, clearly stated on his website that he was a master at softball. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. It's like, why would you put that on there? Somebody's going to read that. You know, it's like, oh, judo. Yeah, okay. He was a judo champion at 11 or 12 or whatever. And Okay, that's kind of impressive. Golf, golf's not an easy game to play. Master golf, you're doing pretty well. He's a tennis master. Okay, tennis, not an easy game to play. And these are sports that the elites can relate to. By the way, man, they could not get Tiger Woods back fast enough. Tiger Woods is supposedly on this comeback trail, and they're just, you know, the media, the sports media is panting for Tiger Woods to finish top three in a tournament here and maybe, you know, somehow win the Masters. The only way Tiger Woods is winning the Masters is they came up with some new improved version of his clone. That's the only way he's winning the Masters. Because whatever they've been trotting out for the last three or four years was a poor excuse for a golfer, let alone Tiger Woods. They're just so panting after him. Anyway, Keith Rainier went from being in the lap of luxury. He was the man, right? He, he was sleeping with Hollywood actresses. He was like God. He was telling them how many calories a day to eat. He was changing their physical form. And that's what gods do. And that's part of what today's show is about. It's about the changing of physical form, who's behind it, and what are the real profits and motivations of what's taking place in the transgender industry. That's right, an industry. This is not just a movement. And remember, nothing is organic. I'll tell you what was organic. There, there was almost a riot that broke out in New Jersey yesterday when these lawmakers passed a 7-3 to three vote that having a religious or philosophical exemption for your vaccines was going to become much more difficult. So, for instance, if you were an atheist and you had a philosophical issue with vaccines, you would say philosophically, I don't, don't agree with this. We have it here in Texas. You have to go and jump through some hoops and get a certification. You take it to the school and they go, okay. It's a pain in the ass to get it. But I did it. I went through it until two years ago. And then that stopped. Um, so they passed this exemption or the lack. So they tightened the exemption. They tightened the exemption. So now if you are not wanting to get your kid vaccinated, you've got to show them, like the school officials, you know, the order takers, uh, you've got to show them religious certification. Like some kind of certification that you're a Catholic or a Methodist or whatever it is. So if people are really serious about vaccines, They'll join a church just to get their kids a certification. We'll get them baptized, converted, whatever. So I would assume that, you know, there's a kickback effect. Like, you know, once David Hogg start, you know, crying out about against crying out about against guns and you know and all the other you know bullshit that's coming out of his mouth, I'm sorry. Um, what happened? Gun sales went through the roof. NRA memberships doubled. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I didn't join NRA, but I'll tell you what, I went to their website. Well, let me go to the NRA's website. What's all the, what's all the fuss about? What's all the hubbub about? 
Well, David Hogg was great for gun sales and he was great for NRA memberships. And this is the kickback. This is the recoil. That's what happens. So now in New Jersey, what's going to happen? More people are going to go to church to get their kids a certification so they don't have to get vaccinated. But there was a near riot. They shut this meeting down. They had, they, had to shut, they had to shut the meeting down. That was organic. That was not synthetic. And I'm going to say something here that is uh, probably really on the edge. Really, really on the edge. At some point in the not too distant future, there is going to be an event like this. And I can see it happening. I've been watching videos, YouTube videos. There's a guy by the name of Grindall. I want to have him on the show. He, he, he posts videos constantly. And he has been like on the front lines of Agenda 21 and Agenda uh, 2030. And, and, it is, it, he's, and he's in Southern California. And these people in Riverside County, uh, Ventura County, I mean, particularly Riverside County, these people have been mobilized, totally mobilized. And they go and they go to the city council meetings, they go to the planning commission meetings, and they take these people on. They, they, they're serving people with, um, uh, you know, like a summons. I mean, and I'm, I'm talking about the people in the council or the planning commission. They're getting served like during these meetings and people are refusing to accept this. I mean, it's getting very, very heated because a small group of people at a local level are seizing power and they're being emboldened and they're being aided and abetted by the very rich and very powerful forces that are five, six, seven, eight, levels above them in the pyramid and they're order takers and some of them understand what's going on they're they're in the game they're playing the game they've been given they said you're going to be given a seat at the table whatever that means you know you're going to you know you do this and this is what you get and maybe that even includes a little condo in the in the underground bunker so these people do it. Some of them will do it because maybe, just maybe, they're, I don't know, ideological, they're ethically driven, you know, by, by some perverse standard. But I don't really think that that's the case. There may be a few of those out there, but these people know what they're doing. In the case of the vaccine situation, people are going to get money. Money. Who do you think is going to contribute to their re-election. Pharmaceutical companies, of course. And I'll bet you, I'll bet you the bulk of them are probably within about a 500 mile radius of that town in New Jersey. I, 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 I nothing to base it on. It's my sense. It's my sense. Uh, so I've been watching these, these town hall and planning commission meetings with the, uh, on Grindall's YouTube channel. And and I can just see the level of frustration and anger getting higher and higher and higher. Now, these people in New Jersey, they weren't there to combat Agenda 21 or Agenda 2030, but they were there basically saying, we don't want vaccines in our kids. And you're making, you're making it more difficult now. Well, the next step is they're going to take away the religious exemption. Religion is going to go away. That is on the docket. And in fact, Facebook today, or yesterday, or yesterday or today, they removed a picture of Jesus from Facebook because it was too graphic. But the vile, I think he was probably, you know, being crucified. The violence was too graphic, they removed it. Apple removed Easter from its calendar on the iPhone and the iPad, the iWatch, whatever, 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 whatever I appliance I have, they removed it. So this is an all out war on Christianity, Christianity. 
it's not an all-out war on Islam, Judaism. Nope, not in the least Christianity. But at some point, that's gonna. That's I'm assuming. I am assuming that Christianity is going to come under the guidelines and the bullet points of the emerging. Um, gest not gestalt, no, the emerging zeitgeist, right, of what's taking place now with censorship, with determining what's suitable content, not suitable content, who gets shown. Google is running mad algorithms to keep search results. I mean, you know the story. It's happening. It is on. It's, it is on. And then the basis and the foundation of all of that is, does it create a sense of unease, dis-ease, bullying? Does it, does it border hate speech? Now, these hate speech laws, the hate speech laws, the anti-terror laws have crept in to what's taking place in the United States because Google, Facebook, YouTube, are essentially transnational companies, even though they're headquartered respectively in what? Uh, Cupertino, where, where, where's, where's, uh, where's Google? I think Google's in Mountain View. YouTube's in San Bruno. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're, that's where they're headquartered, but these are transnational entities. Like you go to Germany where they have incredibly rigid hate speech laws, and you'll encounter Google, YouTube, and Facebook there. And it's through the erection and the application of the digital fence, in a lot of ways, that this has been able to take place. I'll tell you what's going to happen. In one of these town meetings, in the not so distant future, people are going to really lose their shit. Like, there will be a bridge too far. There will be that moment where clearly the numbers of the people are against something at a local level. And it probably won't be the first time they will have encountered it in that place and, and it may not be gun violence god i hope it's not gun violence we don't need any more gun violence and i'm not even advocating violence in general but i'm telling you right now some point in not so, so distant future people are going to lose their shit at one of these meetings and they are going to go after those people sitting behind their elevated desks looking down upon everybody else. And when that, that happens, when that happens, that is going to be a game changer for a lot of reasons. First of all, they may not allow those public meetings to take place any longer. They're, they're, they're so cordoned off now and they're so uh, moderated and staged that it's really, really hard to get through, cut through the process. Although so it's probably an important thing to do. And I think that's one of the things that I'm going to do now that I'm hanging out and fly over. I'm going to get, I, I'm going to, you know, this is a level that I might be able to participate in. It's funny. I was at this uh, opening last night for this really great, like, wedding space around the corner. Beautiful. I mean, incredible. And uh, it was a nice spread and great food and, uh, you know, wine and champagne and beer, and they had, uh, you know, craft cocktails. It was fantastic. It was really great. And everybody in that place, the majority of them, I'll tell you right now, those people are, are Christians. That's like, that's where I'm living. And so I have that, you know, they asked me, well, what do you do here in, the, in Fredericksburg? I'm not going to tell them I'm an astrologer. I mean, that didn't even really go over that well in Austin. And that's Austin, okay? I got two responses in Austin. One was, oh, that, that's great. Do you, do you work at the college? I'm like, oh, shit. 
an, an astrologer, not an astronomer, you know, newspaper, horoscopes, that guy, that's me. Then there was the Christian response, and they knew what an astrologer was. And we'd be having a, just a fine conversation. And it would be, oh, well, you seem nice enough. I won't hold that against you, and I will pray for you. And I got that. Like, out of the 10 people, I might get two that actually knew what an astrologer was and, was, and weren't freaked out by it. And this is Fredericksburg, okay? This is not Austin. So last night, well, well welcome to our town, Robert. Well, what do you do? Well, I'm a counselor, life coach person. I help people. That's it. That's the undercover story. Counselor or life coach person. And that's fine. I'm fine with that. They don't, they don't need to hear that I'm an astrologer. At least not now. This, this, this town is not wired for it. I'm telling you. Lovely place. Lovely people. But not wired for it. Life's weird, huh? I mean, because here I am. I'm like... You know, I'm clearly seeing what's going on with religion, specifically Christianity. And I, will, and I will defend the right for people to practice their faith, especially Christianity, because, you know, there seems to be an all-out assault on Christianity now. I'm not, and I'm not clearly not into the end time stuff. I'm just not. And it may be of significance. And it seems like that's the one that's promoted more than anything else. But even those people are going to have to deal with the fact that they're being, um, you know, hazmated. And it's happening. It is totally happening. And why? Why? Well, there's a new religion coming, boys and girls. A new religion. And a new religion needs new gods. It needs new acolytes. It needs a new set of rules to live by. And that religion is transhumanism. And the bridge between human and transhuman is the transgender. And I've said this for a very long time that transgenderism was a step between the human and the transhuman. And that will be the new religion. Transhumanity will be the new religion. And people will become a version of their own God because they can create and alter their body and change certain things about the body which prior to the latter part of the 20th century that uh, very few doctors could even do and even approach. And it's still an imitation, a pale imitation of some greater creative force. And then there are the creator gods of the movement. And I can guarantee you that they see themselves exactly as creator gods, that first they themselves must alter and change their own identity so that others can be made in their likeness. This is what's going on. And not only that, not only is it part of a new religion, a new belief system, a new species, a new set of rules and codes to live by, new gods to worship. There's a lot of money in it to boot. So it's also an economy. We're going to talk about that today. And some of the stuff I'm going to read to you is going to blow your mind, and it's going to give you an idea as to what the driving forces are, what the market forces are. You know, I have that conversation with that kid earlier in the week. We talked about this. We talked about the philosophical or the ethical responsibility 
ability to either disengage from the market forces or if you are a lock-in economist to understand that the market forces are part of an organic expression of a macroeconomic social model. And if that takes place, then all you're really doing is being a free participant in an organic macroeconomic social model. You're playing a part, you're playing a role. Because if it wasn't there, if it wasn't evolving along those lines, you couldn't play a part in it. And just by the, the dint or the reality of it happening, therefore validates its not just significance, but it validates its reality in our life. That it is a force of nature unto itself. When I read this to you today, and this is what I was this is what I was getting at, and what I was trying to have a in a light conversation with him, which I I think we really did. I said, well, what if there are ethical concerns about where this is headed? Because we are not living in a Lockean universe anymore. Like, I am sure royalty like to dress up like men or women. There's a rumor that Queen Elizabeth I was actually a man. It happens all the time. Right? Shakespeare's actors. They were actors. They weren't actresses. They played the male roles. They played the female roles as well. Okay? Actresses came later. So this altering of the identity, well, that's been around for a very long period of time. But not to the extent that the identity is altered genetically, biologically, anatomically. This is clearly way outside the comfort zone of the Lockean macroeconomic universe. It's in an alternate universe. But if the market supports it, then it must not be bad, right? You know, you know, it goes along with that. Well, if I don't do it, somebody else will. If I don't do it, it's like those people on the city council board or the planning commission. If they don't sit there and pass the damn bill and get all the goodies that go along with it, somebody else will. And why would you want to let them do that? Why would you allow them to have all the fun and all the goodies and all the pleasure and all the power, the power to sit back and all these people snarling and drooling and fist pumping and chest pounding and eye bulging and they can't do a damn thing. But you have the power over them just by simply voting yes to pass a certain measure. And that's a big middle finger of them, isn't it? And think of all the power that that person has. And that person is, do you think they go home and they lose sleep at night over the decision? I sure as hell hope so, but I doubt it. You think that they had to sit there and really, really, really wrestle with their conscience over the fact that what they're doing is going to really impact people's lives in a way that may be irrevocable. One step towards irrevocability and that they're playing a part, that they're sealing the fate of their children and their children's children's future and in ways that aren't even going to be comprehensible to most people because they're coming out with a whole new wave of vaccines that are going to freaking blow your mind okay blow your mind they're not going to be your average garden variety vaccines these are going to be vaccines that will change you at a genetic level they're going to turn the whole concept of vaccine into a supplement they're going to rebrand vaccines and they're going to start calling them supplements. Just like when you go to GNC or Whole Foods or Amazon to get a vitamin or mineral. And what they're going to do at a genetic level, they're going to change you forever. They're going to alter you. This is where it's all headed. It's huge money. Huge, huge money. I mean, Big Pharma spends, they're the biggest lobbyists in capital 
pill. They should, they should be outlawed from lobbying, period, end of story. Um, but these people, they just get a sense of power, right? It's like, it's the big fuck you. Hey, hey look at that. You couldn't do shit. Ha, ha, ha. For whatever reason, maybe they're sadistic. Maybe they're really sadistic. Maybe they were bullied. Maybe they're Satanists. Maybe they just think that they're so filled with the truth from the marrow to the flesh that that is their divine right, not given to them by God, but by science. One of these days, I am telling you, and it's going to happen sooner rather than later, there's going to be a town hall meeting, planning commission meeting, and people are going to lose their shit, and they're going to go after the people that are sitting there behind their gavels. And it won't be pretty. It will not be pretty. And those people that are sitting there, they're going to get a lesson. And it will be a costly lesson because there's going to be changes coming. That will happen. I mean, they're, they're already happening. It will be changes. You may have these you know, meetings um, that won't even be in person anymore. You'll, be able to, you'll go online. You know, everything's going virtual anyway, so you'll go online to be a part of a town hall. I mean, I'm sure that's already happening somewhere, but that might be um, the status quo, you know, the industry standard. But it's going to happen. And those people that are sitting there, they're going to be petrified. And there are two things that will take place. Number one, they'll either get hardened and go deeper into their shell and into their bunker and into their fuck you. Or some of them may actually have a real revelation and see their life flash before their very eyes. And then do it about base. Um, there's a story. I'm going to get into the, trans, the, the transgender stuff really quickly. But there's a story about, speaking of um, somebody taking responsibility for something, there's a, a story about a CDC whistleblower who was found dead. I worked with a guy from the CDC one time. You should have seen this guy. He was... Uh, not very stable. He was not very stable. He was really incredibly unstable. And it was a really menial job. I was delivering bagels. This is back in the 90s. And this guy was delivering bagels, and he was kind of assistant manager. He was, you know, you know Johnny all-purpose. But he was, he had this edge about him. Holy smokes. And he started to talk about it. He said, he said he used to work for the CDC. And, and he was like freaked out. And he said, you would not believe what they carry around in vans, in unmarked vans. If you knew what they carried around in unmarked vans, you, you would shit yourself. That's what he told me. And the way that he said it was like not like, you know, he wasn't laconic or anything. He was, you know, he was really upset and disturbed. This guy was on the edge. Anyway, one of these days, it's going to happen. It's going to happen soon. And you're going to see this. And it'll, it's going to be interesting. There's got, I mean, that could be a tipping point for this, the next, you know, whatever. Because we're at this point, astrologically, where Pluto is coming back to the position that it was in during the American Revolution. 26, I believe it's 26 degrees. In fact, I can tell you right now where it is. Which means that this, there's going to be a revolution in this country. It's going to happen. Now, is it going to be a Bolshevik revolution? Is it going to be an American revolution? You know, what's it going to be? Is it going to be a combination of both? You know, but this is when the American revolution started. It started with Pluto in Capricorn. All right, hold on a second. I should know this by heart by now. Forgive me. All right, hold on. Give me one moment. I just so I, 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 you know, it's a Mercury retrograde. I want to be, I want to be clear about what I'm talking about. Here it is. Okay. 27 degrees. Pluto is at what right now? 21, 21, 21 degrees, six degrees away. 
in 2020, we're going to have that Saturn-Pluto conjunction. That's at 22 degrees. Saturn moves past that, and then uh, eventually, we're going to have that Pluto-Pluto return, the Pluto return of the United States in the second house, the foundation of everything. And that is coming. That is coming. And they know it, too. They know, they know astrology. These people know astrology at a high level. All right. So let's get into this sub. Uh, the economy, the transgender economy. Now, before we get into this, and it's a, it's a story I'm going to be reading. It's actually a, a very well-researched piece, and it's kind of long, but uh, I'm going to read it to you, and, and uh, it's worth it's worth being me reading it to you. And I want to thank uh, my good buddy Mo for sending this in my direction. Also, Tim. Tim Smith, if you're out there listening, and I know you listen, I just heard what, uh, about uh, your, uh, your condition and your recovery, and I wish you all the best and uh, hope you are back on your feet and scrapping in the world sooner than, than later. Get out there quickly, Tim. Send you my love, brother. I just heard about it. So if you're listening, Here's a message to you. Get well, get back in the game. All right. Just wanted to, share, wanted to say that. All right. So let's get into this. The piece, the, the, uh, it's a, this incredibly well-researched piece, it's on the Federalist, and the author is Jennifer Bielek. And this came out on February 20th, 2018, which is appropriate. It's the end of Aquarius, the beginning of Pisces. And the headline is, Who are the Rich White Men Institutionalizing Transgender Ideology? So one of the characters that I'm, you're going to learn about here is Martine Rothblatt. Now, I've talked about Martine Rothblatt before. Martine Rothblatt is also known as Martin Rothblatt. Well, he was Martin. He's Martine now. And... Uh, Martine Rothblatt. Let me let me let me read you the the uh, the Wikipedia bio for Martine A. Rothblatt. So Martine Alana Rothblatt, born 1954, is an American lawyer, author, and entrepreneur. Rothblatt graduated from the University of California, Los Angeles, with a combined law and MBA degree in 1981. Then began work in Washington, D.C., first in the field of communication satellite law, and eventually in life sciences projects like the Human Genome Project. She is founder, she is the founder and chairwoman of the board of United Therapeutics. That's a company you're going to hear more about. She was also the CEO of Geostar and the creator of Sirius XM Satellite Radio. So, Martine's got some money. Uh, Rothblatt was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1954 to Rosalie and Hal Rothblatt, a dentist. She was raised in a suburb of San Diego, California. She was a he, by the way. Just keep that in mind. You know, keep that in mind. Rothblatt left college after two years and traveled throughout Europe, Turkey, Iran, Kenya, and the Seychelles. It was at the NASA tracking station in the Seychelles during the summer of 1974 that she had her epiphany to unite the world via satellite communications. She then returned to UCLA, graduating summa cum laude in communication studies in 77 with a thesis on international direct broadcast satellites. As an undergraduate, she became a convert to Gerard K. O'Neill's High Frontier Plan for Space Colonization. And after analyzing his 1974 Physics Today cover story, on the concept as a project for Professor Harlan Epps' Topic in Modern Astronomy Seminar, Rothblatt subsequently became an active member of the L5 Society. Timothy Leary was part of that group. And its Southern California affiliate, Organization for the Advancement of Space Industrialization and Settlement, more commonly known as OASIS. Isn't that cute? During her four-year law MBA program, also at UCLA, she published five articles 
on the law of satellite communications, prepared a business plan for the Hughes Space and Communications Group titled Pan Am Sat. About how satellite spot beam technology could be used to provide communication service to multiple Latin American countries. She also became a regular contributor for legal aspects of space colonization to the Oasis newsletter. Okay, this goes on and on and on and on. Aviation, personal life. So this is really fascinating. Okay, so 1982, Rothblatt married Bina Aspen, a realtor from Compton, California. They have uh, four children together. And Aspen legally adopted, um, Ralph Blatt and Aspen legally adopted each other's children. That's nice. In 1994, at the age of 40, she came out as transgender and changed her name to Martine uh, Aliana Ralph Blatt. She has since become a vocal advocate for transgender rights. It's so fascinating. There's no mention of Martine as Martin. None. It's like Martin Rothblatt has been scrubbed. Okay. Uh, social activism in 2004, Rothblatt launched the Terrasem movement. Here's where it gets interesting. A transhumanist school of thought focused on promoting joy, diversity, and the prospect of technological immortality via mind uploading and geoethical nanotechnology. I'm going to stop it right, right there. And I'm going to play an interview that took place at South by Southwest with Martine Rothblatt. And the uh, woman that's interviewing Martine Rothblatt just loves that her mind has been broken. I come to South, South by Southwest to have my mind broken. And Martine Rothblatt does it all the time. What a weak mind. All right, let me play this. Here we go. Kat Matson coming to you from South by Southwest, and I have with me now the keynote speaker for day three, Martin Rothblatt. I still don't the actually have words to capture Rothblatt. the way that you broke my mind. I still don't one of the reasons why I come to, to South by Southwest to have my mind broken. Can you give us in a couple of sentence, sentences the essence of what it is that you do, the essence of your work? Sure, Kat. Well, thanks for um, interviewing me. I appreciate uh, the time to be with Australian sure, audiences. Sure, Kat. Well, thanks for And uh, uh, the essence of my work is trying to keep people living longer, happier and, uh, lives. And uh, we do that mostly in my pharmaceutical company, United Therapeutics, by working to create an unlimited supply of transplantable organs so people won't have to die due to the unavailability of the organ transplant. And then in my personal uh, foundation outside of my company, we're working on a new technology called Mind Clone, where we're able to put into computer form people's um, mannerisms, personality, recollections, feelings, beliefs, attitudes, and values, and keep them alive forever in a cyber form, looking forward to the future when their minds might be able to be downloaded back into a regenerated human body. Uh, it's so exciting, so exciting. Now, you spoke a lot in the presentation today about mind cloning, um, and you just gave us a really good, I guess, outline in terms of it's a computerised version of ourselves. You spoke, though, about how we're actually already creating the first step towards that in terms of our mind files. Can you tell us about that? Yes, Kat. Uh, mind files are a basically anybody's uh, collection of their mannerisms, personalities, recollections. Um, any of us with a Facebook or, or um, Google account that we've put into it, all of our videos, our pictures, our social media activity, our e-commerce activity, there's a complete digital uh, collection of all of the information of your consciousness right now. All that it's waiting for are really clever uh, software engineers, hackers, to create MindWare, which is a consciousness operating system using software to wrap around all of that digital file of yourself at Facebook or Google and create a simulcra or a digital doppelganger of your own consciousness. 
I love that, a digital doppelganger. Now, from a social media footprint perspective, one of the conversations that we often have on the podcast is we don't always reveal all of ourselves. We're often being extra positive or we're hiding the stuff that we don't necessarily want other people to see. What are the implications for that from a mind file and mind cloning perspective? It's a really interesting question, Kat, that uh, will, if these mind files have an incomplete picture of us, will they really be a copy of our natural self? The fact of the matter is, is that social psychologists have seen that people forget much more information than they actually remember. In fact, within a week, we've forgotten 80% of the information we had at the beginning of the week. All of us naturally kind of try not to think about the worst parts of our lives and try to think more about the better part of our lives. So I think our mind clones might actually be our better selves. Hurry up. We're just so exciting. Changing tack totally, one of the themes here at South by Southwest this year has been um, female entrepreneurs and what women need to do to continue to, um, I guess, fight the equality um, battle. You were announced in, as you were welcome to stage today, as, the, as America's highest paid female CEO. You're also known to be transgender. So I'm really curious, do you think your success in that regard, in terms of equality, has been informed by the fact that you started life as a male? And so you think differently about these things. Well, Kat, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think there's no doubt that comparing me to uh, the accomplishments of a female CEO who was socialized as a girl from childhood is not a fair comparison at all. I've been socialized with a point of view that I'm the firstborn, I'm the male, I should succeed. Um, At every chance I was given an opportunity to have higher ambitions and higher goals. All of the role models that I saw, certainly more than 99% of them, were males, and I had already um, started and launched uh, satellite communications companies as a male uh, before I transitioned to being a woman. I'm uh, very proud and, and honored to identify as a woman now, and it's what my soul always was. But from an income perspective, the only thing that I really hope comes from my compensation is that it will help shatter the glass ceiling that has prevented women from he- having comparable pay with men. There is really nothing else to say. Martine, thank you so much for your time. I know it's been an incredible afternoon for you. Thank you for your time. And again, thank you for um, breaking my brain so I go back to Australia a little bit more expanded. Oh, well, it's absolutely my pleasure, and I'm a big fan and lover of Australia. So you guys keep coming over here stateside. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, my God. What What do you say to that? I mean, it's like, thank you for breaking my brain. You know, why, why, first of all, the whole idea, like what, like what they, when he talks about growing organs, it is not about growing organs indiscriminately or independently for people that just, you know, get into an accident or have some kind of, you know, physical malady and they need to have their organ replaced, you know, it's from United Technologies, Organs Are Us. It's about creating your own organs so that you can replace your own organs. If you've got a bad liver, well, guess what? You got another one sitting around waiting for you or grown on demand or gallbladder or a kidney or any of those things. That's what that's about. That is is what United Technologies is about. It's about creating replacement parts for your body. And the whole idea of these people not wanting to die, it's ridiculous. There's nothing wrong with death. It's imp- it, it happens. It's part of our experience. It makes life poignant. It gives it a richness. You know, I'm 57 years old. I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago when I began these podcasts and doing this work. My consciousness is different. My awareness is different. My awareness of time on the planet is different. My body is different. And it's not for the better, the body part, I'll tell you that. But the poignancy, like, you know, living with the sense that, you know, I may have 
5, 10, 15, 20 years. Who knows? It's clearly seeping into my consciousness, and it makes things different. Life has a richness. You, you, you start, you know, it's like, what do you, you know, you, you get to this point, or I got to this point, like, where am I on this, on this equation of getting older? And there, there are two things, there are two paths you can take with getting older. One, you can crawl into a shell and begin to debilitate, dissipate more and more each day, or you can just keep banging your, your drum in the sun. And that's, that's the path that I'm choosing. But what is so wrong with death? People die. It happens. And it can be very profound. And these people are cheating themselves because they're terrified. They are terrified of death. I get it. I'd like to live maybe 120, 130 sometimes. Yeah, because I'm 57 years old and I'm just starting to figure things out a little bit. You know, it's like, oh, okay, I'm getting it. I don't want the window closed that quickly. But at some point, I'm okay with the window closing. And I think that's part, that's part of the trip. That's part of the trip on the planet. So I just wanted to geolocate Martine Rothblatt as a key member in a movement. He is not an isolated actor, somebody who is confused about who they were, or maybe not confused. Now they know that they're really a, a woman of a soul. You know what? You were born in a man's body in this lifetime. Why don't you figure it out? You know, figure it out. You were born as a man. Figure it out. By the way, um, have, you, have you seen Bina? What is it? Bina 4000 or whatever it's called. It's his wife. But it's, it's a it's a AI version of his wife. Oprah interviewed her one time. The same guy that made uh, Sophia, who was given citizenship in, in Saudi Arabia, is the guy that made Bina Martine Rothblatt's the clone or the robot, the AI of Martine Rothblatt's wife, Bina. Well, you, know, you know, how come people don't ask like really salient and potent questions? when they have a chance to interview Martine Rothblatt. Like, why did she ask him, are you fucking mad? Are you insane? I mean, think about this just for a second. Think about what he's proposed here. First of all, he's decided that he's become, he's going to become, he became a woman. And, you know, free real world, if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do, but you know, I believe that the, and, and what's happening in, 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 in indoctrinating children to change their sex at three or four or five, that's insanity. And the insanity starts from the top. So I believe it's an insane position to have. Completely insane. Okay. That's insane. And then this whole idea that you're going to upload your consciousness, your memories, and you have it brought back down and reanimated into a body, it's, 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 again, it's insane. I mean, on the surface, it, it is insane. But because we live in a culture that's promoted science fiction, and I like science fiction for such a long time, and now we're into celebrating the possibilities it is no longer under the auspices of being insane. It's like exciting. Oh, hurry up. By the way, there's already a simulacra of you. I've talked about this before. And uh, Miss Rothblatt should know that the NSA has essentially doppelgangers of everybody. Know, ex know exactly who you are, what your buying tendencies are, what your power. I mean, they've been sucking information from Google, from Facebook, from AT&T, you name it. It all goes into a tranche that's associated with you. And they're able to actually have predictive models of who you are based on all of that. And that's even at a really, really fundamental level 
a basic primary level that they sell for commercial purposes to companies so they can predict your behavior, predict your likes, dislikes, and then promote things more intelligently and directly to you. All right, so we just wanted to kind of give you a sense as to Martin Rothblatt, who's a prime mover and shaker. Now I'm going to read you this, uh, this piece. I swear to God, it's going to blow your mind. All right. So this is a first person by Jennifer Billick, thefederalist.com, February 20th, 2018. As an environmental activist who was deplatformed from speaking from a speaking venue by trans activists in 2013. Let's just think about that. She's an environmental activist. She's like, you know, doing everything she can for the environment. She's deplatformed by a group of trans activists. Whoa. In 2013, I developed curiosity about the power of this group to force this development. A year later, when Time Magazine announced a transgender tipping point on its cover, I had already begun to examine the money behind the transgender project. I have watched as all women's safe spaces, universities, and sports open their doors to any man who chose to identify as a woman, whereas men who identify as trans women are at the forefront of this project. Women who identified as trans men seem silent and invisible. I was astonished that such a large, such a huge cultural change as the opening of sex protected spaces was happening at such a meteoric pace and without consideration for women and girls safety, deliberation, or public debate. Concurrent with these rapid changes, I witnessed an overhaul in the English language with new pronouns and a near tyrannical assault and those who did not use them. Laws mandating new speech were passed. Laws overriding biological sex with the amorphous concept of gender identity are being instituted now. People who speak openly about these changes can find themselves, their families, and their livelihoods threatened. These elements, along with media saturation of the issue, have me wondering, is this really a civil rights issue for a tiny part of the population with body dysphoria? Or is there a bigger agenda with muddied interests that we are not seeing. This article can only begin to graze the surface of this question. But considering transgenderism has basically exploded in the middle of capitalism, which is notorious for subsuming social justice movements, there is value in beginning this examination. Who is funding the transgender movement? I found exceedingly rich white men with enormous cultural influence for funding the transgender lobby and, a vari and various transgender organizations. These include, but are not limited to, Jennifer Pritzker, a male who identifies as transgender, George Soros, Martine Rothblatt, a male who identifies as transgender and transhumanist, Tim Gill, a gay man, Drummond Pike, Warren Buffett, and Peter Buffett, John Stryker, a gay man. Not only is he a gay man, but he sounds like he's a porn, gay porn guy. Doesn't that, that sounds like a gay porn man, John Stryker. And then there's Mark Bonham, gay man, and Rick Wieland, a deceased gay man, whose philanthropy is still LGBT-oriented. So these are the movers and the shakers in the transgender movement. Here's how it all goes down. Most of these billionaires fund the transgender lobby and organizations through their own organizations, including corporations. Separating transgender issues from LGBT infrastructure is not an easy task. All the wealthiest donors have been funding LGB institutions before they became LGBT oriented. And only in some instances are monies earmarked specifically for transgender issues. Some of these billionaires fund the LGBT through their myriad companies, multiplying their contributions many times over in ways that are also difficult to track. These funders often go through anonymous funding organizations, such as Tides Foundation, founded and operated by Pike. George Soros pumps a lot of money through the Tides Foundation. Large corporations, philanthropists, and organizations can send enormous sums of money to the Tides Foundation. 
specify the direction the funds are to go, and have the funds get to their destination anonymously. It's like money laundering in some ways. Tides Foundation creates a legal firewall and tax shelter for foundations and funds political campaigns, often using legally dubious tactics. These men and others, including pharmaceutical companies, bing, 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 and the U.S. government are sending millions of dollars to LGBT causes. Overall reported global spending on LGBT is now estimated to be $424 million. It's low. It's going to go up. From 2003 to 2013, reported funding for transgender issues increased more than eightfold, growing at threefold the increase of LGBTQ funding, which quadrupled from 2003 to 2012. This huge spike in funding happened at the same time transgenderism began gaining traction in American culture. $424 million is a lot of money. Is it enough to change laws, uproot language, and force new speech on the public to censor, to create an atmosphere for, uh, of threat for those who do not comply with gender identity ideology? Question mark. Transgenderism. Here we go. A new medical and lifestyle market. It seems obvious now to look at the money behind transgenderism. Many new markets have opened because of it. The first gender clinic for children opened in Boston in 2007. In the past 10 years, more than 30 clinics for children with purported gender dysphoria have arisen in the United States alone, the largest serving 725 patients. Over the past decade, there's been an explosion in transgender medical infrastructure across the United States and world to treat transgender people. In addition to gender clinics proliferating across the United States, hospital wings are being built for specialized surgeries and many medical institutions are clamoring to get on board with the new developments. Doctors are being trained in cadaver symposiums across the world in all manner of surgeries related to transgender individuals, including phalloplasty, vaginoplasty, facial feminization surgery, urethral procedures, and more. More and more American corporations are covering transgender surgeries, drugs, and other expenses. Endocrinologists seeking the fountain of youth and hormones for more than a generation, and the subsequent earnings for marketing those hormones are still on a quest for gold. Puberty blockers are another growing market. The plastic surgery arm of medicine is staged for an infusion of cash as well as organ transplants, especially womb transplants for men identifying as women who may want future pregnancies. These surgeries are already being practiced on animals, and the first successful womb implant from a deceased female donor to another female donor has already been a success. Biogenetics is poised to be the investment of the future, says Rothblatt, who has headed a massive pharmaceutical corporation and is now heavily invested in biogenetics and transplant. That's United Technologies. Transgenderism has certainly made its way into the American marketplace. So it seems important to consider the implications of this as we pass laws regarding transgender individuals and our civil liberties. Transgenderism sits square in the middle of the medical industrial complex which is by some estimates even bigger than the military industrial complex. With the medical infrastructure being built, doctors are being trained for various surgeries, clinics opening at warp speed, and the media celebrating it. Transgenderism is poised for growth. The LGB wants a tiny group of people trying to love those of the same sex openly and treated equally within society has likely already been subsumed by capitalism and is now infiltrated by the medical industry complex via transgenderism. Who works to institutionalize transgender ideology? Ah. Well, it's strange before, it's about to get very interesting. Much more important than funds going directly to the LGBT lobby and organizations only a fraction of which trickles down to assist people who identify as transgender is the money invested by the men mentioned above, governments and technology, and pharmaceutical corporations to institutionalize and normalize transgenderism as a lifestyle choice. They are shaping the narrative 
about transgenderism and normalizing it within the culture using their funding methods. They're using money to essentially create a sense of normality around transgenderism. Why? Because there are fortunes to be made. Absolute fortunes. And not only that, they get to play God. They themselves, having become God of their own body, no longer the sex that they were, that they inherited through a biological inheritance, they've liberated themselves from the human species. No doubt. So now they can do the same and create others in their own image. This article will use the Pritzker family as a case study, both to reduce length and because they are emblematic of how this works. Those funding trans organizations and normalizing transgenderism are channeling funds in the same ways and invested in the same medical infrastructure. Okay? This can hardly be done. This can hardly be a coincidence. So they're basically funding the infrastructure and then they're funding the normalization, the laws, the talking points, the media, they are running the funding on two tracks. This can hardly be a coincidence when the very thing absolutely essential to those transitioning are pharmaceuticals and technology. It is also important to note that through the trans law, though the trans lobby has sown itself to the LGB umbrella, LGP people as such are not lifelong medical patients. That's true. They are not lifelong. There, if you become a trans person, you are involved in this thing for the rest of your life. And some of the things that go down as a trans person that you have to do in order to keep certain orifices open, you don't want to know. All right, here we go. The Pritzkers are an American family of philanthropic billionaires worth approximately $29 billion, whose fortune was gestated by Hyatt hotels and nursing homes. They now have massive investments in the medical industrial complex. Examining just a few of the Pritzkers uh, in this article will give you some indication of their reach and influence as a family, especially as regards the transgender project and their relationship to the medical industrial complex. As you read, remember, transitioning individuals are medical patients for life, and the Pritzker family are not an anomaly in their funding trajectory or investments in the medical industrial complex. Jennifer Pritzker. Once a family man and a decorated member of the armed forces, Jennifer Pritzker now identifies as transgender. He made his transgenderism a high note in philanthropic funding through his Tawani Foundation. He is one of the largest contributors to transgender causes and with his, and with his family and an enormous influence in the rapid institutionalization of transgenderism. Some of the organizations Jennifer owns and funds are especially noteworthy to examining the rapid induction of transgender ideology into medical, legal, and educational institutions. Pritzker owns Squadron Capital, an acquisitions corporation with a focus on medical technology, medical devices, and orthopedic implants. And the Tawani Foundation, a philanthropic organization with a grants focus on gender and human sexuality. So what do we have here? We have the foundation and the corporation running simultaneous tracks. One is laying the track for society to accept it, either through some form of normalization or some form of coercion. Either way, it's going to happen. And the other is laying the tracks technologically for people to essentially bring the two tracks together so that they're synonymous and operating as one functional organizing principle. Pritzker sits on the Leadership Council of the Program of Human Sexuality at the University of Minnesota, to which he has also committed $6.5 million over the past decade. Among many other organizations and institutions Pritzker funds are 
Lori's Children's Hospital, a medical center for gender nonconforming children, serving 400 children in Chicago, the Pritzker School of Medicine at the University of Chicago, a chair of transgender studies at the University of Victoria, first of its kind, and the Mark S. Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies at the University of Toronto. He also funds the ACLU and his family funds Planned Parenthood, two significant organizations for institutionalizing female erasing language in support for transgender causes. Planned Parenthood also recently decided to get into the transgender medical market. How, where do these people get the time to do, I mean, they're, I mean, this is driven, right? He's on the board of all these institutes. I mean, this blow, this shit blows my mind. Like there, there is a maniacal consciousness at work here. It almost feels possessed because only somebody possessed should do things like this that are basically inhuman. I mean, take a look at your own life. What do you do? You get up in the morning, you have breakfast. Most of the time you think about your day. Some of you work, some of you don't work. You got a family, you do all these things. By the end of the day, you're sacked. Meanwhile, trans man Pritzker is like, you know, running 10 different organizations to basically create a new human paradigm. How does that happen? I, I, I mean, maybe there's drugs involved here too. Not just hormones, maybe Adderall, who knows? Or, or maybe there is some, you know, other force that is at work that is possessed, focused, and maniacal in its pursuit of what it's, what it's tackling. So let's get into Jennifer Pritzker. Jennifer Pritzker funds strategically, as does his family, by giving to universities, here it comes, that become beholden to his ideology. Goes right to the universities, whose students go on to spread gender ideology by writing pro-trans articles in medical journals and elsewhere. Jennifer's uncle and aunt, John and Lisa Pritzker, gave $25 million to the University of California at San Francisco for a center of children's psychiatry. Jennifer likewise funds hospitals and medical schools where the alumni go on to create transgender specialties in LGBT medical centers, even though lesbians, gays, and bisexuals don't need specialized medical services. Here are just several current activities of the Prisker-funded medical school alumni and recipients of Prisker money. James Heckman founded the LGBT Medical Care Center in Lakewood, Ohio. David T. Rubin sits on the advisory board of Accordant, CVS Caremark, the largest pharmaceutical chain in the United States. CVS acquired Target Department Store Pharmacies in 2015. Target, of course, is the site of a major social controversy about unisex bathrooms. It is a corporate funder of the Trans Pushing Human Rights Campaign activist group. Lauren Schechter is the author of the first surgical atlas for transgender surgery. Author of pro-trans journals was awarded for the legal advocacy of transgenders, performs reconstructive surgeries, and is director of Trans Feminine, conferences sponsored by the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, also known as WPATH. He also performs reconstructive surgeries at Weiss Memorial Hospital in Chicago. Schechter is also the surgeon's only sessions chair on the scientific program committee of the newly formed United States arm of WPATH, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, US PATH holding conferences in Los Angeles and surgeon and for surgeons in transgender surgeries. Surgeons, stand, they you know, look, they stand to make a lot of money with transgender surgeries. A lot. That's why they're doing it. It's a whole new marketplace that's opening up. Robert Garofalo, a gay man, is the director of the St. Louis Children's G Gender Clinic, head of the hospital's division of adolescent medicine, and a professor of pediatrics at Northwestern University, which J.B. Pritzker who we will meet later, funds. Benjamin N. Breyer is chief of urology at San Francisco General Hospital and a professor at the University of California at San Francisco specializing in 
transgender surgery. Note the urology part. Nicholas Matt teaches at the Mark Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity. Studies at the University of Toronto with a specialty in queer studies. Jennifer Pritzker also funds the Bonham Center. Matt lectures around the country on transgender issues and espouses the idea that we are not a sexually dimorphic species. Mark Hyman is the Pritzker Foundation Chair in Functional Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic and Director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. Cleveland Clinic conducted the United States' first uterus transplant. Baylor College of Medicine is in on the receiving end of the Pritzker School of Medicine's pipeline programs for people studying to be doctors. Baylor is where the first nation's first child was born from a uterus transplant. As part of an experimental program, funding the procedure for 10 women in order to develop uterus transplants. Ultimately, health insurance and taxpayers will pay for rather than being relegated to elective infertility treatment. Jennifer Pritzker has also helped normalize transgender individuals in the military with a $1.35 million grant to Palm Center, a University of California, Santa Barbara-based LGBT think tank to create research validating military transgenderism. He has also donated $25 million to Norwich University in Vermont, the military academy, and the first school to launch a Naval Reserve Officers Training Corps program. Pritzker's funding is not confined to the United States, but reaches other countries via WPATH. So they're funneling money around the world. And all of this tax deductible, tax freaking deductible. And conferences for physicians studying transgender surgery and funding international universities. Let's go on to Penny Pritzker. Penny Pritzker, cousin to Jennifer Pritzker. Penny Pritzker served on President Obama's council for Jobs and Competitiveness and Economic Recovery Advisory Board. She did a great job, didn't she? She was national co-chair for Obama Amer of Obama for America. She's known Obama for years. Chicago. And national finance chair, she funded Obama. National finance chair of Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. To say she was influential getting President Obama elected would be an understatement. As Obama's Secretary of Commerce, Penny Pritzker helped create the National Institution for Innovation and Manufacturing Biopharmaceuticals, also known as NIMBLE, by facilitating an award of $70 million from the United States Department of Commerce. $70 million, the first funding of its kind. Obama made transgenderism a pet issue of his administration, holding a meeting at the White House, the first ever for transgenderism. The administration quietly applied the power of the executive branch to make it easier for transgender people to alter their passports, to get cross-sex treatment at Veterans Administration's facilities, and access public school restrooms and sports programs. Based on gender identity, these are just a few of the transgender-specific policy shifts under Obama's presidency. Soros and Gill are two other major transgender movement funders who generated millions of dollars to get Obama elected. And Stryker was one of the top five contributors to Obama's campaign. Under Obama and President George W. Bush, the federal government also funded the Tides Foundation with $82 million, which in turn donated half of that, $42 million, to LGBTQ issues over the last decade. That's your tax dollars. Penny has funded the Harvard School of Public Health, and with her husband, through their mutual foundation, the Pritzker Traubert Family Foundation, are funding early childhood initiatives, as well as providing scholarships to Harvard University medical students. The Boston Children's Hospital Gender Management Services Wing physicians are all affiliated with the Harvard Medical School. Penny Pritzker also sat on the board at Harvard, where student life offices teach students, many of whom go on to lead U.S. institutions, that there are more than two sexes. Okay, we got one more Pritzker to deal with here, and that's J.B. Pritzker. Penny Pritzker's brother, J.B. Pritzker is an American venture capitalist, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and business owner. He is co-founder of the Pritzker Group, a private investment firm that invests in digital technology and medical companies, including Clinical Innovations, which has a global presence. Clinical Innovations is one of the largest medical device companies, and in 2017, required Brenner Medical, another significant medical group, offering innovative products in the fields of obstetrics and gynecology. JB provided seed funding for Matter, 
a startup incubator for medical technology based in Chicago. He also sits on the board of directors at his alma mater, Duke University, where they're making advances in uh, cryopreserving women's ovaries. JB is running for governor of Illinois in 2018 and put $25 million into an Obama administration public-private initiative totaling $1 billion for early childhood education. What do you think you're going to be teaching those kids? If they donate a billion dollars to teach those kids anything they want them to teach. And his wife, M.K. Pritzker, donated $100 million to the Northwestern School of Law, partly for scholarships and partly for the school's social justice and childhood law work. Where do these people get this money? I have an idea. I have a theory. I think a lot of the money, this is just my, an opinion, not a fact. I think a lot of the money is illicit. We have to look at why. It's an opinion, not a fact. It's an opinion. We have to look at why this is framed as a civil rights issue when the main issues seem to be capital and social engineering. There doesn't seem to be a sphere of influence that is untouched by Pritzker money. From early childhood education in universities to law, medical institutions, the LGBT lobby, and organizations, politics, and the military, if they were the only ones funding institutionalization of transgender ideology, they would still be fantastically influential. But they are joined by other exceedingly wealthy, influential white men who also have ties to the pharmaceutical and medical industries. Now, I just want to step back. There's a little bit more I want to read here. But I want to take a step back. I mean, just think about what I read to you. That's a lot of information. But it's clear that if you really, really look at that information and put it all together, what do you, what do you see? You see a plan. You see a blueprint, a plan, a map, and it is thorough. It is not haphazard. It is, it is not impromptu or improvisational. This is a soup to nuts plan to change our culture, our identity, our language, our geolocation on this planet as humans and profit off of it enormously. This is, has nothing to do, nothing to do with people's rights. It is a small percentile of the public, an infinitesimally small percentile of the public. And the representation in terms of the investiture of the operation is incredibly lopsided. Think about that. Think about the percentile of the population and everything I just read to you from one family. It's mind blowing. And this is and this is happening while you sleep. Right now, while you're listening to me. There there are nodes of this synthetic and manufactured reality that are being connected right now. Connecting, 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 connecting. And the, the levels of connection are mind-blowing. Whether it's connecting with a child who thinks that they're a boy, not a girl, a girl, not a boy, or a parent who thinks their child is a boy, not a girl, and a girl, not a boy. That's the ultimate level of connection, right? That's the connection that you want to make. It's that human connection, which set, then sets everything else into motion. And then there are other nodes and other connections that take place. It's like an assembly line of transformation and change. And they've lined it all up. And it's happening 24-7. And while we're living our lives, while we're trying to get by, while we're trying to retain our humanity, these people are doing their damnedest to change all of that. To change it irrevocably. And to the point where if you have something to say about it, if, if you have a dissenting opinion, then you're kind of herded and cordoned off into another area. 
Because that's not allowed. Let's read a little bit more here. Pharma and tech giants, all in for transgender, along with support by pharmaceutical giants such as Janssen Therapeutics, the Health Foundation of a Johnson & Johnson founder, uh, uh, VIV, VIIV, Pfizer, Abbott Laboratories, Bristol Myers, Squibb, and Boringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals, medical or sorry, major technology corporations, including Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Intel, Dell, and IBM, are also funding the transgender project. In February 2017, Apple, Microsoft, Google, IBM, Yelp, PayPal, and 53 other mostly tech corporations signed on to an amicus brief pushing the U.S. Supreme Court to prohibit schools from keeping private facilities for students designated according to sex. They're all in on it. As these corporations were pushing for transgender bathrooms, they were fighting President Trump's travel ban and immigration policies. And reporting the incident simultaneously, CNN News made the obvious connection between the corporation's interest in the immigration ban and commerce, quoting a legal brief signed by the companies that said, it is inflicting significant harm on American business, innovation, and growth. Ah, oh, there's that Lockean model. Business, innovation, growth. Macroeconomics. It made no such equivalent connection for the corporation's interest in transgender rights. The obvious question would be, why do they care? The obvious answer is money. Melding this manufactured medical issue with a civil rights frame entails the, co the continuance and growth of the problem. Transgenderism is framed as both a medical problem for the gender dysphoria of children who need puberty blockers and are being groomed for a lifetime medicalization and as a brave and original lifestyle choice for adults. Martine Rothblatt suggests we are all transhuman, that changing our bodies by removing healthy tissue and organs and ingesting cross-sex hormones over the course of a lifetime can be likened to wearing makeup, dyeing our hair, or getting a tattoo. If we are all transhuman, expressing that could be a never-ending saga of body-related consumerism. Holy shit! I just, I, it, it's, it's mind-blowing to wrap your head around this, that there are people like Martine Roth, Rothblatt who are pushing this idea of artificiality, that biology is not a big deal, that, you know, get a cross-section of, uh, you know, transgender genes, and it's just like, you know, putting eyeliner on. The massive medical and technological infrastructure expansion for a tiny but growing fracture, fraction of the population with gender dysphoria, along with the money being funneled to this project by those heavily invested in the medical and technology industries, seems to make sense only in the context of expanding markets for changing the human body. Trans activists are already clamoring for a change from gender dysphoria to gender incongruence. In the next revision, the International Register of Mental Diagnoses codes, the ICD-11, the push is on for insurance paid hormones and surgeries for anyone who believes his or her body is in any way incongruent with his or her gender identity. Bodily diversity appears to be the core issue, not gender dysphoria. That and unborn people from their biology via language distortions to normalize altering human biology, institutionalizing transgender ideology does just this. This ideology is being promoted as a civil rights issue by wealthy white men with enormous influences who stand to personally benefit from their political activities. It behooves us all to look at what the real investment is in prioritizing a lifetime of antibody medical treatments for a minuscule part of the population, building an infrastructure for them, and institutionalizing the way we perceive ourselves as human beings before being human becomes a quaint concept of the past. This article has been corrected to note the difference between Baylor University and the Baylor College of Medicine. The two are no longer connected. And Jennifer Bielek is an artist, environmental activist, writer, and an engaged citizen. 
So I wanted to take you down that very deep, very long rabbit hole to give you an understanding and an idea as to what's happening to Earth and what's happening to humanity and what's happening to, to us on a daily basis. You know, when, jo when Jordan Peterson took on the state because he did not want the state telling him what to say. It's like, that's what he, you know, that's how Jordan Peterson lost his gig. He wasn't going to address a transgender person as a G or a Z or whatever they wanted to be because the state was telling him to do it. And that was, that's just one small fractal of the institutionalization from a top-down level. These people have a plan. They have, got, they have got a serious plan. They've got a serious roadmap. And these people have been doing this stuff for, for decades. They've been involved in social change, social justice. They've, they've basically reprogrammed our schools. They've reprogrammed um, the welfare state, taxation. They've, they've been engaged in this kind of activism connected to capitalism for decades. They know exactly what they're, they're doing. They've got a manual. They've got a map. They know how it's done. And they have huge sums of money for all the fools that'll take it and get their research grants or sign off on uh, the new normalization of language or whatever it's going to take. It's just like those people sitting behind uh, the gavel at the, at the, at the, City Hall meetings or the Planning Commission. It's the same deal. It's just up a few levels on the food chain. That's where we live. That's where we live on the planet. That's what's happening. So, number one, you need to know about it. Because it's a big deal. And it's going to get bigger. And number two, you've got to hold on. To, if, like, if you're listening to me, you may say, okay, you're full of shit or you're hateful, or you're ignorant, or you're paranoid, and I'm just going to go on and live my life. And that's your choice. That's fine. But I would say to you, and even to people that are listening, and are saying, wow, this is like crazy, mind-blowing, bizarre, weird, incredible, you know, insert any description you want, you got to retain your humanity. Like, you've got to retain your humanity. Like, we... We are, that is the front line. That is where the battle is taking place. It's about the retention of your humanity, your dignity, your freedom, and everything that came, that came with you. With your user's manual. Wow, mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing. Oh. When I first read that article two nights ago, and my jaw dropped. So Jennifer Bielek, congratulations to you. You've done an amazing job researching, and I'm grateful for all the work that you put forth here. And by passing along, I hope that I've done your work some real credit. Real credit. Well, let's see if there's anybody in the uh, chat room. If we have any, uh, any, any chat going on. Uh, double playback. I say yuck to that. Great, great opening. Yeah, nine minutes ago. I don't know about the double playback part. Everything else here is pretty much the same as it ever was. But thank you, Faux Hat. Uh, I want to try to leave, you know, on kind of an up note here because you know, I've just uncoiled a lot and it's and it's pretty I, I don't know it's, it, it, it's bizarre the whole thing is bizarre I mean when you really get down into the biological mechanics of what what they're doing and it's 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 beyond bizarre I mean it's almost it's almost grotesque what's taking place we have these great bodies and these great forms. I'm speechless, to be honest with you. Absolutely speechless. And it's rare, because I usually have a lot to say. 
But I kind of I kind of reach the the event horizon of being able to actually talk about this. So again, I think the remedy of the prescription is to uh, is to retain your humanity, and not just retain it, celebrate it. You know, find ways to do it. You know, keep your heart open, and uh, do your best to um, live a divine and sacred path. Because nowhere in any of this, right, is there any talk of living a sacred life or you know, the sacredness of the human form. No, it's just, it's, I mean, the, the way the Rothblatt, I mean, he, he demeans the human form by comparing it to some cheap dime store mannequin that you can just insert products into or change the lashes or darken the rouge. He cheapens the human experience. He desecrates it. Absolutely desecrates it. Well, don't allow that to happen. Venerate yours. All right, I'm going to get on out of here. And um, I'll be back on Sunday night for sure. And we'll get back into the live stream. There's, there's some uh, good stuff happening astrologically. We're about ready to go into Ch Chiron and Aries. And, um, and Uranus and Taurus. By the way, all the transgender stuff is Uranus and Taurus. It's the technological transmogrification of the form. Got it? All right. All right, I'm out of here. So here we go. Uh, use your head to discern what's real, your heart to use what's possible. Thanks for hanging in here today and uh, allowing me to deconstruct that. So I'm going to play the new, the new show music on the way out of here. Have a great weekend. in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off.